Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. My name is Brandon Hoy, co-owner of Roberta's, a super duper awesome place. Roberta's is a very, 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 very proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. We're also super awesome. Thank you, Heritage. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. America, from border to border, coast to coast, and all the ships at sea. Streaming live from the County of Kings, Brooklyn, New York City, on the Heritage Radio Network. Are you ready for the fastest half hour on the internet today? It's the Mike and Judy Show. Spanning the globe for high-minded hijinks and low-brow kicks to bring you the best in sex, drugs, rock and roll, and nuclear fission. They're too bad for radio and too good looking for television. And now, here they are to pluck the low-hanging fruit of the literati. Your hosts, Mike Edison and Judy McGuire. And here we are back on a Sunday afternoon. It's awesome. I missed you last week, Judy. I know. I was sick. I still have a little bit of a cold. You were were recovering from the Morrissey concert, I understand. I was was in bed for two days afterwards. The Meet is Murder slideshow was just too much for you to handle. (laughs) There were kids in front of us, a a straight couple in front of us during Meet is Murder making out, which just seems like the worst... Thing ever. It's like why? Because Jindal List wasn't showing. <laughs> oh, and I saw I saw one of our Roberta's friends here. Oh, right, um, our, fr- our friend, Christian. the manager, Christian, the manager, who uh, kind of looks like Morrissey. Actually, yeah, he does. He was there clutching flowers. He's a murderer. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, that's true. He works at a media establishment. But I'm really excited because it's National Fisting Day. There is no Woo! such thing as National Fisting Day, Judy. <laughs> Jizzly <laughs> told me there is. Jizzly said so. Well, Mitt Romney says otherwise. <laughs> but I'm also happy to um, that we have the wonderful Bob Burt joining us. Woo! Today. My favorite beatnik, Bob Burt. Yay! Everybody's favorite beatnik. Known for uh, playing in that popular folk rock band, Sonic Youth, uh, and uh, <laughs> and um, banging the. Can and Pussy Glore, my favorite. Bang in the can. As I always say, uh, taught me the valuable lesson that art should be art is like children and should be seen and not heard. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I was listening to right now when I realized that. <laughs> well, you know, that was a day when you could make willfully um, you know, music that was willfully confrontational and uh, put it over as art, I guess. True. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but Bob, Bob's got a very storied career, of course. He's going to be playing with his old friend Liddy Lunch again. Uh, his old band, the Chrome Cranks, are out on the road again. Not really, but we did play a show last week. <laughs> you know, at your age, Bob, that counts as a tour. Okay, true. <laughs> you probably uh, drove to the show. But right? what are you doing to celebrate d- National Fisting Day? Well, actually, I experienced my first fistings this year, so... <laughs> It's, All right. It's, it's, a, it's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> I was surprised because you used to work for Andy Warhol, so I figured you'd be an old hand at this. Yeah. Oh. oh zing. And I didn't bring my snare drum for that rim shot. <laughs> <laughs> rim shot, Bob? Yeah, yeah, rim, rim shot, Rim Bob. shot. <laughs> that's, one, that's one. Okay, I know the music stuff is very cool, too, but one thing I've always been curious about is working for Andy Warhol. What was that like? Did you have much contact with him? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I answered the phone a few times when he called, but I basically was working for his right-hand man named... Uh, Rupert Smith down on Canal Street, but we did all of his silk screen printing there. We right did all, all the editions. Man. And uh, yeah, we did all his print editions, all the portraits. 
you know, while the screen printing was done there. And so. What Wait, a great mean, job, though, for you a young Andy guy. Andy Warhol wasn't pulling his own prints, Bob? No, he wasn't, <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> At the factory? <laughs> <laughs> nope. So you didn't have any tinfoil walls or or socialites overdosing on speed in your in your office no not at all most of the time i was working the night shift by myself <laughs> yeah you weren't, you weren't like hanging around like shooting speed balls with lou nope the only thing that happened was one day uh, i was working the night shift and my boss said oh you know someone's going to come by and visit i want you to show them around the place so the doorbell rang and it was debbie harry and steven sprouse oh that's cool though <laughs> right that was pretty cool the first time the only time i saw andy warhol on the street in New York was uh, it was 1982. I just gotten to uh, NYU. It was like my first semester of college, and I went to see Lou Reed at the Bottom Line. That's when he had uh, Robert Quine and his band. It was actually a good group he had with him. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, Andy Warhol came, and he looked pretty frail. He wasn't looking great. He had this like ridiculous wig on, you know, this big silver, you know, wig. And but he was with these six pretty identical looking preppy blonde boys. These buff blonde boys, all wearing like matching varsity leather <laughs> jackets <laughs> and like you know perfect blue jeans and penny loafers. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. It was very, very inspirational. I saw him a bunch of times on the street and around, and, and there was one time I was in a Soho art gallery, and he used to, like, whenever a new issue of Interview would come out, he would go to galleries and just stand there with a pile, and he would sign them and hand them out to people. And I was just sitting there watching him. There was this big, long, of people, big, long line of people waiting to get their, their magazine signed, and he just, like, walked away from the line and came over to me and said, here, don't you want one? <laughs> oh, that's nice. And then, you know, someone pointed out, Julie Kayfords actually pointed out, Many years later, like, well, yeah, he was cruising the young hot. You <laughs> <laughs> were young That Julie puts a, puts a naughty spin on everything. I don't know her, but that offends me. Bob was young and hot. Yeah, well, one time. <laughs> so, but, you know, working for Andy Warhol, you do seem to be at sort of some nexus of some sort of crazy New York art scene. Uh, you know, and the bands you played in, especially, you know, coming up with Sonic Youth and whatnot. And well, yeah, I was mentioning it to be before how, like, you know, we just did this Chrome Cranks show last week, and there was this uh, article in the Village Voice online with an interview with Peter Aaron, and it was just like, you know, referring back to the glory days of 1992 on the in the East Village, which, you know, it was it, was, it kind of cracked me up. You know, growing up here and, and actually, you know, remembering walking down St. Mark's on my way to the Fillmore East in the 60s, you know, and, and, and experiencing, you know, how the town changed all through the years. I mean, all through the. Uh, you know, the 70s, I discovered Max's and, and CBGB's in like 75, and I was going there constantly and, and, and experiencing all that. When I was in high school, I saw the New York Dolls at Max's in like 1972. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I don't know. Isn't it awesome to have someone <laughs> finally on the show who's older than us, Jimmy? I know, it's yeah. crazy. The, <laughs> the first New York hey, club I went I, to I was I may Max's. be sitting in the same seat that had some dick sat in. <laughs> he, he you might, are. And, and he might be a year or two older than me. He's fif- I think he's 59 this year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not there yet. I got a few. Well, it's got, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you know, we haven't. I haven't hit the half century mark either. And Judy's 20 years away from it, of course. Oh my God, yes, <laughs> I'm barely 30. <laughs> you don't still, look at, uh, still in the bloom of my youth. I just got my period last week. <laughs> nice. Sorry. Yeah, me and Bob are going through menopause over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I remember when I turned 50 and I was standing at Maxwell's and Todd walked by and I just said. I just turned 50. You know what that means? I've been coming to this fucking place for more than half my life. <laughs> I, know, I just uh, I right. saw this. You'd be going to Maxwell's more years than you weren't going to it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just saw that Madonna's Erotica album just turned 20. And to me, that's like, that's kind of a recent record for me. You <laughs> yeah. know, like, what is 20? Yeah, yeah. Well, 9, 1992. Yeah, the, the first uh, Bikini Kill record just turned 20. I'm like, oh my God. You know? <sighs> yeah, time flies. You know, the weird thing is, though, I mean, I think, you know, we, and as a group, and I include you, old man Bob Burt, you know, in this, I think it's our attitude and our outlook. I feel much younger in what we do. I mean, imagine where our parents were when they were in their 40s. I mean, my parents never had any fun anyway, but they were old when they were 24. Oh, you know. Well, yeah, and now I think probably people like young Joe look at us as caution, like, like weird old Joe, Joe the engineer is the next wave shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Watch and learn, yeah. Mr. Joe the engineer. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine last night who I went to high school with, and she has two kids, and they're trying to, you know, they're, right now they're going through the college selection process. And she has said to me before, she goes, you're really lucky you don't have kids because when you do, they're a constant reminder of how old you are. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I just recently, back in May, I went out to L.A., and I was 
at this rock show and I was backstage and I was talking to some young girls and it turns out, you know, <laughs> what was that, that like? I was older than their parents. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, that's what. Was... And, and you're hearing things like, "Oh yeah, you know, my mother turned me on to the cramps." You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and speaking of the cramps, happy birthday, poor Dead Lux Interior. Yes. Oh man, I miss the cramps. You know, yeah, totally. Um, they were always a really good time. I, you know, I have. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people have the same revelation the same had the same epiphany the first time i heard human fly you know i mean it was, it was crazy it was like and then brah, the fuzz comes launching and it was like holy shit this is the coolest fucking thing i ever heard <laughs> in my life and it just really shifted my whole worldview can we form a band that sounds like that what do we do it was like it was just a world changer and the funny part is like i wasn't that you know there's a lot of people that we know are that educated in in where it all came from it took me like two or three cramps albums to realize that all these songs are covers yeah <laughs> <laughs> me too I was just like this is cool new stuff yeah but- Luck, Lux and Ivy weren't exactly Libra and Stoller that's for sure <laughs> but you know I, you know what I feel I think their first album was the last great record they made the singles were great Human Fly <laughs> uh, no Songs of the Lord taught us okay it was, an, a, was a masterpiece but it, it was, was but it's outsider art compared to Psychedelic Jungle by the time they got to Psychedelic Jungle it had turned all paisley and it was chick friendly you know it stopped they, oh the, yeah. chick friendly that, that's, that's, that's what's wrong with that. <laughs> that's right. It was like Paisley and Love Beads, and it was it was. Not, oh, that's what chicks was, are about. I'm gonna it, I'm gonna floor you. I'm yeah, gonna like it, give you the Vulcan br- Death br- Grip or some br- other br- wrestling term. Bring it on, McGuire, because at that point they didn't want to use your eyeballs for dials on their TV set. It became like you know it became like a happy trip. It was just way too 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 friendly. Not oh, I, you're dead. I, t- I tend to. Disagree. It's a very soft record. <laughs> they were still putting on great live shows, and I saw. I them think a lot, it's, their, I think it it's their best album, and I thought yeah, after you know, songs the Lord taught us it was all as great as Brian Gregory was. Kid Congo powers. Like close and, and those, those were very, great live shows, but I think that record just, you know, go home and put it on your old uh, Victrola there. I will. Uh, it's, it's one of the few cramps records that I own. I don't even well, have I don't think it, I don't think, I don't think it compares. There's nothing on <laughs> Psychedelic Jungle. Even Goo Goo Muck is pretty soft compared to Sunglasses After Dark. Garbage Man is, is a masterpiece of sorts. Anyway, so, we're going to stop this sexist rant by Edison. <laughs> and we're yeah, going to really. hear, we're gonna hear some say, though, chick-friendly I, Bob Burt music. My, my last exactly. comment on Lux Interior, though, is I was always impressed that the it older he got... The more into drag and dressing like a woman he was, you know, he was. He was wearing like the G strings and higher heels. The older he got, and he, how old was Lux? He was always older than the rest of us, right? Yeah. He was yeah. kind of like an old guy in the scene, but he looked great. His he, hair, but his hair got higher and he got more into cross dressing the further his career went along, and I always kind of respected that. Right. Okay, so what are we hearing, Bob? <laughs> What are we hearing? Uh, We're hearing the, the, the chick friendliest band of all time. <laughs> yes. Called Pussy Galore. Sweet little high five. It's the Mike and Judy show here on the Heritage Radio Network with Bob Burt. Let her rip. Oh, 
That was great. I'm sorry. I've got a mouthful of Jesus Christ, my favorite Catholic pizza from Roberta's. That was kind of awesome. Bob, always one of my favorite Pussy Galore songs. Oh, cool. I like it when you know. I love it when Pussy Galore, you know, leans hard and kind of the garage rock thing like that. And Dick Johnson, um, to, to me, was you know, which was 95 percent of what we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, well, then there's like the, the, the tape manipulation, and, and and there's a lot of you know, you know, some some of it needs to be heard once exactly. <laughs> but so um, you guys played. Fuck recently you, Mike too. Edison. You guys played recently too, didn't you? Yes, we did. We had a, a reunion last December twenty third, uh, opening for Yellow Tango at one of their many uh, Hanukkah gigs, and uh, it was a blast. Are you going to do that awesome. again? Uh, if it was up to me, it would be the answer would be yes. But I'm not the boss. I'm just a drummer. And, <laughs> just uh, a drummer. I'm, I'm, You're I'm, the spine of the band. You're the one member in that band that's not. I would, I would hate to think that I <laughs> scavenged around the junkyard and built a whole new drum kit for one benefit show, but. We'll see what happens. Uh, after that show, I saw so many photos of like, you know, the, the, the circular saws, the bands, and you know, tying yeah, your yeah, snare yeah. drum and the gas tank, like posted on Facebook. Everybody sort of gravitated towards your, uh, yeah. your junked up, built up drum set, which sounded great. Thank Possibly you. you weren't annoying enough that night. Uh, no. it wasn't the, the treble wasn't tweaked high enough the way I remember the old shows where it was like, <laughs> really like, holy shit, standing in front of that band back in the day was really... Well, I, I was shocked because like standing back in, back in the day, you know, John was a lot more meticulous and... and uh, I remember the sound checks with that metal drum kit going on for hours, <laughs> and we like got the Maxwells and set up, and you know we ran through some songs. And, oh, that's great, you know. But but John John is a is a perfectionist. I mean, we both worked with him a lot. Yeah. And by the way, that's John on uh, the Mike and Judy theme music. That's um oh cool. You know, uh, and that's John Spencer who's been a guest here on the Mike and Judy show as well, and our, our good friend. But John is definitely a perfectionist. I mean, to yes, work with John. Yes. I mean, he is he is. Um, and that's why his records always sound so good. I think that's why the Blues Explosion sounds so good. And exactly. And the Pussy Galore records, and obviously you know. I'm teasing a little bit, but when he wants to turn the screw, you know, and push you back off the speakers, he knows exactly what the fuck he's doing. Yep, exactly. Um, what about what's going on with the, the Chrome Cranks? Well, you know, the Chrome Cranks, um, we fell apart in the 90s and didn't speak to each other for 15 years, and then we got back together in, <coughs> excuse me, 2009, and we did uh, two shows, one in Brooklyn, one in Manhattan, and then we did another show in, in uh in France for a lot of money, and then the we French got, really like to pay. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it was great. <laughs> that was like you know, I loved it. Just flying away for a weekend, rocking a bunch of kids, and flying back with a ton of money in your pocket. The Rolling Stones didn't talk to each other for fifteen years either, but they actually made records during that whole yeah, time. Yeah, same with the Ramones. <laughs> you know. But we all moved away and got different lives and things, and then uh, we managed to get back. To, and then we got back together again in 2010, I, did two more shows, and then recorded this album, which finally came out this year. And then fucking, it took forever just to get this one show together, dealing with everyone that lives in different states and different crises that were going on at the time. And it's turned out William Weber, our guitar player, who also played in Gigi Hour, right. along with you. Um, not not along with you, but yeah, another, another a colleague. Yeah, another colleague, ex GG alumni, <laughs> and uh, he couldn't make it, so we got Kurt Wolf from Pussy Galore to fill in, who did a great job, and uh, yeah, we so finally we played this gig last Saturday, which was packed, and we rocked it, and it was great, and but I, I totally experienced that whole nightmarish situation of the East Village, of what it is nowadays. While I was loading my car at three in the morning, I saw some guy get beaten to a pummel by five Guidos. And then this other person, that, uh, this couple from Virginia who are really big fans and have been like promoting the show since it was announced months ago, came up for the weekend. And then when they were at the show, supposedly someone slipped a date rate drug into the guy's drink and he uh. doesn't even remember seeing his favorite band that he's been waiting five months for. You know, it's just like, 
just a lot of weird things going around, around surrounding that whole situation, but it was a great show. That used to happen to Tim Warren all the time without the date rape drugs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we're both uh, veterans of Crypt Records as well. That was always, you know, Tim, Tim would, I love you guys, I'm coming to the show, and uh, he'd be spinning records, and by the time he hit the stage, he'd be like face down, and uh, you, know, you know, sort of have to like lift the phono needle off of his head. <laughs> uh, so we got a Chrome Crank song to play. I know you think this is like the best record you guys ever made, right? Yes, it is, because... Uh, you know, we grew up, we settled down, and, and we finally did it the right way. And, and uh, yeah, we recorded it upstate New York in this big barn, the same place where the recent Swans records were recorded. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it's Was that in Kingston? This place wasn't in Kingston, but it was nearby. I can't remember which town it was in. What's the, what's the name of this song? Uh, this is called Rubber Rat. Okay, can you spin that one, Joe? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Holy shit, that sounds fantastic, Bob. That oh, really, thank you. Really, really, really does, does sound yeah. great. It's um, you know, it's so hard for me to get excited about rock music anymore. It's just <laughs> like, you know, no, it's like the dumbest shit on earth. And after years of being pummeled by electric guitars and and the big beat, it's you gotta be gotta have something that's something extra to really get my attention. And the Crump Cranks sound really, really fucking good. Bob, what 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 kind of young bands do you listen to? I mean, you're really involved in music. The Beatles so. are no longer young, Bob. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 wow, that's twice in one I really, I really, I really can't think of anything that's brand new and young that really floats my boat. Most things that not I the do, Lady Gaga. No, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know. Well, we'll say you're going to go out on a, not a Saturday night, but um, like a Thursday night. What kind of show do you go to? Arena shows ever? No, um, I've gone to millions of shows my whole life, starting mm-hmm. when I was a teenager, and. Um, Nowadays, it, it, it really takes an old favorite, like, you know, Red Cross or someone like that to get me out of the house. Right. Or, or if friends of mine are playing down the block at Maxwell's, like uh, Ian Savonius's Chain in the Gang, I, I saw pretty recently. And, and um, I can't think of anything that's real brand new, like all this, you know, crap coming out of Williamsburg doesn't do anything for me. Or Well, don't worry. They're not going to be coming out of Williamsburg <laughs> anymore because they can't afford to live there. Well, isn't yeah. that, that's the thing, though. The people who live there can not only afford to live there, but can afford to work on their yeah. art. And I say that in gigantic quotation marks, their art and their music, um, because exactly because they're rich. Because they have money. I mean, it's so hard. You know, when we were coming up, I'd sit in a bar in the Lower East Side. You never knew who you were sitting next to in some dive bar. Right. You know, it could be, you know, some, you know, out on, on his luck uh, poet or some 
the next great film director or some guy who had a novel in his pocket that was going to like break through and be huge or a painter. Now, you know, it's like hedge fund douchebags. I was reading today in the New York Post on the way over here. Um, that guy that wrote the book Why Quit Goldman Sachs is yeah, kind of in the news like right now. Douche. What a fucking tool. Right? <laughs> Seriously, yeah, he's complaining about his half a million dollar bonus. You know, <laughs> poor little rich boy. But he was saying it was in the late 90s, he had to go to Alphabet City. Okay, right? Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, he roughed it because there was not near any subway. I mean, there's never been a subway in Avenue B, but, you know, I'm just laughing because we all know. We haven't called it Alphabet City since when? Since like the mid '80s, you right. know. And now Avenue B might as well be Avenue fucking Bistro. You're better off buying a wicker chair there than a bag of dope. <laughs> I mean, back when we were talking about, it, I never, you know, Avenue A was sketchy enough. Avenue C was like verboten. Oh my God! I, don't get me started there. But in the few minutes we have left, I want to go back that to that point. And uh, next week or the week after, on November third, will be the 30th anniversary of my very first show with Sonic Youth. Wow. Which was also the night that I met my idol, Lydia Lunch. And ironically, 30 years later, on the same date, she's going to be in my house. And we're getting ready to do a week of shows uh, with this uh, retro virus, doing a whole uh, career-spanning thing of hers. And uh, it's going to be awesome. I'm Actually, right after this, in a few minutes, I'm going to be meeting uh, Weasel Walter and... I'll just kizzies uh, from the swans, and, and uh, we're going back to my space in Hoboken to work it up. And uh, for the people that are around here, we'll be playing at the Knitting Factory in Brooklyn on November 15th. And if you're even the tiniest bit of a Lydia Lunch fan, you, you wouldn't want to miss this show. We're, we're, we're covering all bases. I'm Is, looking forward to that. I'm, I'm very excited about yeah. it, too. Now, look, Lydia Lunch, 30-year retrospective. I mean, can you imagine 30 years, you know, when she was doing Teenage Jesus or wherever it was at 30 years later? It's like, wow, it's, yeah, still, yeah. it's still resonating. And she's great. Yeah. yeah. And she's, you know, that, that was the great thing about her is she never stuck with one thing too long. So it's like a lot of styles of music. And it's all great. We're starting off with some Teenage Jesus songs, going into Eight Eyed Spy, 1313, Queen of Siam. We're, we're doing it all. We're ending, uh, I don't want to give away the set list too much, but uh, ending with a classic Alice Cooper cover. <laughs> um, have you ever played with her before? Uh, well, I recorded Death Valley '69 oh, okay, with her, right. yeah, and, and um, which we're going to hear in a, a second. A little bit things here and there, but um, no, nah, I've never actually been in, in one of her bands or anything like that. Yeah. Well, but we've been, we've been close friends for for a long yeah, time. Yeah, we had a great gig uh, together opening up for uh, exactly. with, uh, the Bauer, Bauer Electric with uh, yeah. Bob and uh, Mickey Finn and uh, my, my own thing, yeah. my own traveling road show. So I, I, I still have the poster hanging over my computer that she signed with. Uh, Bob beats it so good. <laughs> <laughs> so where can I mean this is this is an international show since it's available on the internet. Um, where else are you guys playing besides the knit? Uh, and how can people find info? Uh, they can find info, I guess, <laughs> on the internet. Uh, we're playing uh, two shows in Los Angeles. One that has to do with the uh, Fashion Institute, um, which is on November eighth, and then we're going up to San Francisco and playing there on the tenth at the Verdi Club, and then we're coming back to LA playing the Echo on Sunday the 11th. We're going from there to Toronto. Not sure what the date is, but uh, then we're playing Hamilton, which is 45 minutes away from Toronto. And from there, we're coming right to the Knitting Factory. So it's like it's a tour. six shows it's in a like tour. seven days. Kind you of. guys have to hook up some of that European money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, she's we, big we, in Europe, right? Yeah, like, we will. And we, we already talked about uh, some future plans, but right now we got we to gotta rock this out. So. I mean, I feel like there's so many things that we haven't even discussed, like we, BB we, Gun, hey, your yeah. writing, your yeah, BB your Gun, art. one of the all-time great. Uh, you know? I, 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 I don't it's even like to call it, BB Gun a fanzine. It's nice to it's so much better than that. It, I nice to, it's nice to think that my life expands beyond, beyond 20 minutes of a radio show. <laughs> 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 at least you're at like at least 47 that's minutes. It's 30 years <laughs> to be here and behind a pizzeria in Bushwick. That's, that's why I'm working on my book, which is going to be mostly photos, but I just wish I had the drive of these two excellent writers here. <laughs> Because it just, I hate writing. <laughs> oh, just ask for help. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, yeah. you could do it. Yeah. You just need a deadline. You need someone to buy that <laughs> off the proposal. And once you have a deadline where if you don't turn it in, you won't get paid, it's a big it's a big motivator. Never forget, yeah. Bob, Mike and Judy are here for you. All right. Yeah, speaking right. of book authors, I want to give a shout out to our friend Lisa Carver today, whose new who's book in is in the New York 
Times Magazine today. This is just absolutely fantastic. Um, her new book, Reaching Out with No Hands, Reconsidering Yoko Ono, which is absolutely a fabulous book. And it was excerpted in today's New York Times Magazine. A giant excerpt. It must be like 2,000 words. And um, it's a must read. And I hope oh. it catapults her to the stardom that she so richly deserves. I've been skipping the Sunday Times for the last few weeks. I'll have to pick it up today. Yeah, definitely. You pick know, up you know, the you know save, save the five bucks that the Times costs you and buy her book. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and we should also mention Judy's book as well, of course. The of course. official book of sex, drugs, and rock and roll lists, which is available. Starring a list by Bob Burt. Exactly. And, and Gisley, speaking of national. <laughs> oh, did, Gisley, did the Gisley list make the book? No, the Gisley book got me canceled by uh, your ex employer. <laughs> but. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm celebrating with Jizz in spirit. I'm fisting in my head. But, nice. So we're going to go out with a Bob Burt extravaganza number. What is this, Bob? The Sonic uh, Youth. Death Valley 69. All right. Once again, it's been the Mike with and Judy Lydia show Lynch. for Judy McGuire, and Mike Edison, and Bob Burt here on the Heritage Radio Network. Thanks to Joe the Engineer. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes Store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.
Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.